experience. I'm going to just uh, briefly introduce folks, but then uh, really give them uh, some time to, to talk more about what, who they are and what they do. Uh, and then I'm going to moderate with some questions. Uh, and then um, I want you folks to also uh, weigh in with some questions uh, and comments to them. Um, Barbara uh, Rapson is president and CEO of the Massachusetts Health Quality Partners. Um, it's a, re a nationally recognized coalition of health care providers, insurers, patients, uh, academics, and they have been um, publicly uh, publishing um, data uh, on Massachusetts, including one of the first ever to publish patient experience data. So we're excited to have Barbara. Um, Pat Focarelli is Vice President of Healthcare Quality at Beth Israel and Deaconess, where she's responsible for more things than I can even say <laughs> around patient safety, risk management, patient relations, ethics, uh, and a whole host of info. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, hearing her talk on the panel. Grace Cordovano um, has had uh, decades of experience as a patient and patient advocate, and she uh, founded Enlightening Results in uh, 2010. Uh, she works tirelessly, tirelessly for patient advocacy, particularly in cancer care. Uh, thank you, panelists. And I'm going to start out um, asking you each to just uh, give about five minutes uh, of intro. Okay, should we start? So good morning and congratulations to the Society for Participatory Medicine for your first in-person meeting. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I will probably talk fast because we have so much we want to share. Um, it, the Mass Health Quality Partners, or MHQP as we call ourselves, has been measuring patient experience for over two decades and um, in the last uh, sort of several years, our board has been more focused on not only patient experience, measuring patient experience, but going beyond that to understanding patient engagement. And so part of our gateway into that was one of the questions that we ask in our annual statewide patient experience survey of patients with their primary care clinician. And while in Massachusetts the scores around communication, patients report really high scores uh, for their providers with really small variations, so just really solid communication scores. But we asked a new question, and that was, um, how often does someone in the practice talk to you about your health goals? And uh, while the scores for communication were in the high 90s, when we asked about that com communication, whether people are asking me what's important to me, it dropped down into the, sort of the 50 and 60 percentile. And when we followed up that question with, how often does someone in your office talk to you about barriers to addressing your goals, then the scores tanked. We went into sort of the 20, 30 percentile. So we, we, we understood that while patient engagement um, and people will report great communication, when you start asking people about their um, how they're engaged, we're not doing such a great job. And so we really have to understand what this communication is about. So there's two other things that I want to quickly mention is that um, as part of our board interest in patient engagement, we set up a patient engagement work group, a multi-stakeholder work group as everything with MHQP. And we decided that we really wanted to understand the landscape in Massachusetts about what's happening with patient engagement. What are our primary care practices doing? And we realized we had no clue. So uh, we partnered with CRICO, and with funding from CRICO, we, we sent out a survey of all 400 practices, primary care practices, both adults and peds. And we asked them a series of questions about uh, organizational supports that they have in place for engagement. And so, um, and then we were able to compare those results to our patient experience scores for the same practices, which is was really interesting. So um, what we found was, um, in terms of the engagement, there are a lot of supports in place, but um, but patients and providers are not using them so much. So while we said, okay, how many times do you have a care plan in place, or do you have care plans in place, it's, you know, we had about 80% of the, patient, the practices said yes. When we asked about um, uh, do they work with their patients to set care plans, then the scores go down to the 60s. And then we said, how often do people who need care plans have them? And then it dropped to under 20%. So, you know, the, all the patients that need them. So, so we have these vehicles in place, but we need a lot more uh, in terms of training and supports to help the practices and the patients do a better job with this. Um, 
we also found, and this is something that we were, were planning to publish, so I can't say too much about, but there, there, was, there was no correlation with patient experience and patient experience, patient ex engagement. The practices that did well in patient engagement and those that did well in patient experience, which, which raises so many questions. It could be just a timing issue, but it's something that um, we obviously need to find out more. So then, um, very briefly, I also want to mention another thing that we're doing around patient engagement, and that's co-design. Um, we have a woman on our board from Olin College, and she's introduced us to uh, the aspect of co-design with patients. And so we delved into this big time, and we partnered with MadPow, which is a human-centered design firm. And we um, pulled together a workshop around uh, patients, uh, understanding what patients, how pain is assessed with patients, um, because we understood that the 10-point scale that we use is just um, not any form of engagement. <laughs> um, people don't understand it. And the fact is that um, pain scores, uh, we want to better calibrate pain scores with opioid prescribing because the opioid crisis is such a huge crisis. And what we find is um, if some of the, the ways that we assess pain are not adequate and it leads to unnecessary prescribing. So we, um, we found, uh, delved into this um, workshop um, about how patients pres uh, are, how we assess pain. We pulled together patients, specialists, pharmacists, primary care docs, surgeon, pain, pain research, academics, sort of the whole, sort of a 360 of anybody that can be involved. And we just found some fascinating things about how pain is assessed. And, and our system is, quite frankly, dysfunctional. And the lack of trust that exists is humongous. And there's also, um, we fail to inspire sort of and empower our patients with hope who, who have pain. And um, it, there's, I, I don't have time to go into much more, but um, just wanted to throw that out as sort of three different areas that, that we've been working on to really engage patients. Good morning. My name is Grace Cordovano, and I just wanted to say I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and honored to have this opportunity to sit uh, with these wonderful experts and to be here with all of you. So I'm looking forward to learning as well as presenting today. As a private patient advocate, I specialize in the oncology space. My passion is working with patients and their care partners from point of diagnosis through survivorship or end-of-life care planning. I thoroughly enjoy what I do. I enjoy working with one-on-one -on -one with patients and at this critical time in their lives when they're navigating their diagnosis and the healthcare system. And these experiences give me a breadth of insight into the realities of living with a diagnosis on a day-to-day -day basis. I get to see the trials and tribulations, uh, what brings joy, what their victories are, what patients and their families define as a success in treatment as well as their fears, their struggles, the impact of financial toxicity, the barriers and unmet needs. And it's these experiences and insights that really drive me and keep me up at night, wondering how we can continue to shape the patient experience, and not just for the people that I'm working with, but in the local communities and for the patient experience movement in general. I would say that my role is to listen to patients, understand what their challenges are, understand what they value, and understand them as a person so I can best empower them with the most pertinent information that they can use to make empowered decisions about their care. And consequently, I also am very passionate about making sure their experience is one of dignity, one of respect, and one that has kindness and is filled with empathy. So um, I'm looking forward to learning more about what both of you do. Great. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. It's freezing in this room, though. <laughs> it is freezing. Um, so I, I work, I'm on the operation side um, of a medical center here in Boston. Um, and so I thought I would reflect a little bit about what we know about patient experience and patient engagement with the lens of someone who's worked in the quality side. And I would reflect to say that we're at the Model T stage of really understanding patient experience and how to engage patients in their care in the right way. Even we're at a place where I feel like we're fairly progressive and we have about 100 patient advisors that are, you know, are engaged in all of our 
uh, care delivery. And so I wanted to talk to you about something that we're doing a little different. So to just um, engage in a conversation about patient experience. So um, most hospitals are set up so that there is metrics, and we've been looking at our quality metrics for many, many years. And also try, in 2007, we were decided we were going to try to eliminate all preventable physical harm. What we recognized is that there's a lot of patient experience uh, and poor patient experience that gets hidden by just following rates. So following rates of central line infections, following rates of falls with injury, following rates of medication events. But within each of those is a story of a patient who had that experience. And so the way our physical harm work improved was by telling the story of the patient. So telling our board the actual story of a single patient who had a terrible physical harm that was completely preventable and counting those numbers in addition to tracking rates so that over time we could motivate our workforce and motivate our clinicians and motivate our patients and families to be engaged with us in trying to make it better. So what we decided we were going to try to do, like now it's about three years ago, is to look at the patient experience through the eyes of patient complaints. Generally in hospitals, this function of hearing from patients either as um, on written comments back on their surveys or hearing from them when you open up a patient family advisory council meeting or hearing from patients and families based on what's coming to patient complaints or patient relations is separate from the governance, the um, structure that hospitals have put in place for quality. So the signal that boards are getting or that hospital leaders are getting about patient experience is largely coming from HCAPs, from how we're doing on survey data. And the same as with quality metrics, the survey data looks kind of good. But what I know is that every year at where I work, 3,700 times someone calls and says they had a terrible experience. Every year. And that activity of saying we're sorry that that happened to you was not getting the same attention in the organization as what was happening with physical harm or what was happening with tracking those age cap rates because now they're tied to payment. So we decided what we would try to do is to use the same approach that we did with physical harm and tell the stories of patients and to actually assign some of those patient complaints as uh, preventable disrespect. And what you start to see is in a, in a body of about 3,500 patient complaints a year, there's about 10% of those that are just terrible patient experiences that are embarrassing and that would never, should never happen in the medical center. And that about 20% of those are severely disrespectful. And I'm going to give you an example of one that I'm sharing at the medical center today. Uh, several weeks ago in one of our ambulatory buildings, a patient was seen late in the day it was a military, a, a, one of our armed services providers in full uniform, um, was seen late in the day in a primary care office. At the end of the visit, the patient needed to have some labs done, and the lab is on the bottom of the building. So it was for, it was, the lab closes at 5.30. It was about 5.20. The physician called down to the lab to say the patient was coming for the test. The patient got down to the lab, 5.25, doors locked. The last window patient can see in that the lab techs are there, knocking, no response. So finally, the, someone looked up and said that the person was at the door showing the time, 527, and the lab techs said, come back tomorrow. Uh -huh. The patient came back the next day. The physician called it out as a disrespectful event, which is starting to happen when you start to make these very visible. Um, and I would, I would challenge any leaders of hospitals in the uh, room whether they would know that that had happened in their medical center. So what we're trying to do is say, is take the same approach to eliminate preventable physical harm to eliminating preventable disrespect in the organization. Counting those, reporting those to our governance, and I'll, I have many more examples because we've been doing this for two or three years, assigning a taxonomy, assigning a severity and thinking about how can we ultimately transform the environment because we're not going to get it through uh, surveying patient experience. We're going to get it from an intense engagement with patients and families. I think the holy grail will be how do we allow those complaints to come from the patient in real time because most patients are complaining about their care or, or 
complaining is not really the right word, expect, expressing um, uh, the wish to help us do it better for the next patient is basically what it is. Um, how do we ha allow the environment to be safe enough to do that in real time? And I think the only way we're going to get there is by normalizing this kind of conversation. So I'll stop there and then um, move on to questions. Great. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, these words, patient experience, patient engagement, patient, I'm an older term, but still used a lot in quality and outcome measures is patient satisfaction. Uh, I think we're, and you talked about the Model T. So <clears throat> what are your thoughts about where we are on this journey? I'm not necessarily saying where we have to go, but talk a little bit, and you've been doing, you've all been, your collective experience is phenomenal, but you've all been sort of passionate and focusing on this for some time. So where have you seen uh, things developing, and how should we be thinking about uh, patient experience? Sure. Yeah. So as in the example I made, um, I gave the patient experience, I mean, we're, we're hearing from patients about what, what they experience, what actually happens. And so um, that's a first step, because if you don't know what's happening, then you can't improve right. it. And so uh, that we will always need that. We will always need to know what the experience is. And, and particularly now, as we're developing new delivery systems and using technologies, we have to start testing those as well, because um, we can say, yeah, isn't this great? And, and it, and it uh, uh, reduces your hemoglobin and, you know, manages all this stuff, but if it's a terrible experience, it's not going to work. It's not going to last. And you can improve it if you ask the patient, okay, this is what I like about it, this is what I don't like about it. So we have to, we have to always ask the patient experience um, so that we can improve things. I, but as um, MHQP's um, sort of pathway and evolution has shown, that it's, that's step one, and that the next step is so, okay, and I know this is something that I've heard Danny mention many times, is patients are the most underutilized resource in our healthcare system. And um, sort of hearing your story, Pat, I think about all the time where I hear people have given feedback to hospitals in the past and they got, you know, was not at all welcome. So this is, this is, this is really important for us to, um, to be open to hearing this feedback, but also uh, to take a step and say, okay, how can we use our patients? They're experts. They know so much. MHQP has an active consumer council, and many of the members are also in the Society for Participatory Medicine, Judy Danielson and um, uh, Nancy Finn and Tammy Rich. Um, and so we have an active consumer council, and they don't want to be passive. Um, they're very interested in, you know, sort of, helping shape things, and so that's why this co-design makes so much sense. But also, this, um, as we started to think about engagement and this, uh, the first survey results that we have, we have to be careful because the healthcare system has a perspective about what engagement is, and it's not the same as what patients' engagement is. And so we, you know, we need each other to sort of rectify that and to get on the same page or at least get closer so that we can create a shared experience that, that that meets, um, you know, all masters. And so that's something that we have a lot of work to do, but I think it's, it's something that um, we're, we're ready to do. And then the, the design, the co-design phase, is it's not just patients design things or user design thing, designing things. It's like everybody's that a, it's going to be an end user being involved in this. And the insights you have are so much different than the usual um, sort of healthcare insights because we are so quick to solve things. You know, like here's the problem. There's the solution. Let's go at it. And so we're constantly coming up with solutions that, you know, then get us in trouble somewhere else. Um, but the, the, the concept of this co-design is this is slow thinking and really understanding what it's like to be in the system and what do you feel and what are you doing um, about things. I mean, we, we heard from patients how incredibly isolated they feel, felt who had chronic pain and they've been, they said, what do I have a sign on me that says don't listen to me? You know, she's, you know, just ignore what she's saying. It's like, whoa. And we had primary care clinicians saying treating Patients with the pain is the most miserable part of my day. I hate it. I feel like they, they're deceiving me on my guard. I mean, it's like, whoa. Yeah. So the, yeah. these are the kinds of things that you can uncover when you, you sort of slow down and bring all the people to the table. And so I think that's sort of the next evolution of, of where we need to go. 
So my approach is from a different perspective and a completely different lens because I'm not looking at it from an organizational standpoint. I'm really looking at it at a level of granularity of N equals one on an individual patient and, and their loved ones and care partner basis. Uh, so my perception of the patient experience is really not metric based, but a real life situation of this particular person and their struggles with their particular diagnosis. So it's a personalized patient experience. And my success has come from acknowledging suffering, suffering almost with the patient, mm -hmm. and really understanding what their values are. And I wholeheartedly agree and have seen it firsthand that many times patients are go into an exam room and the doctor assumes assumes this is what needs to be done, but perhaps they don't realize that the patient has a graduation or a milestone or a wedding or small children or they're caring for an elderly parent. So that complicates things. We're not just treating a tumor. This patient experience has to encompass the whole person. Uh, I'm a strong believer in patient reported outcomes and I've seen firsthand the benefits of including those into a discussion and the value that that brings. I think that's very important in capturing to improve the patient experience and for patient engagement as well. A lot of my work with fashioning and shaping a positive patient experience happens outside of organizational walls. Right. It happens at the patient's home. It happens outside of the clinical appointment. It happens in real life. So there's different nuances that have to be considered when we're defining <laughs> patient experience. We're sitting here um, amongst friends, amongst colleagues, comfortable with coffee. Um, we all have experiences to share, but no one is in pain. Everyone's somewhat comfortable. No one is on the brink of death. Everyone is able to have a conversation and is comfortable. That's not the same luxuries many patients are afforded when they need to make critical decisions. Uh, with respect to patient engagement, I can't drive it home more that the values are the most important thing and understanding what the challenge for the patient is at that moment. And these challenges can change as the days go on, as the disease progresses, and as treatment decisions are made. Challenges need to be asked and discussed frequently. And really listening. Uh, patients and there are families and care partners need to be listened to. And sometimes they feel like no one is listening. So um, I enjoy bridging that gap, and it's very enlightening having those results. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there's not really much to add except to say that every single committee almost in the hospital should have a patient family advisors on the group. <laughs> so, you know, we have, we have um, been on a journey to have almost all decisions made about either developing new materials or re renovating space or making decisions about things like drug shortages, which is our you know, like a real challenge for medical centers right now, to always have the patient voice. And um, so we've strategically put patient family advisors on many, many of our hospital operations committees, in addition to having large patient family advisory committees for specialty areas. And I know some of our patient family advisors are here. Um, it's been transformative because now people ask, um, did anybody ask the patients about that? So it's that kind of a, an approach that just is going to take time. And we are still in the infancy, I would say, of doing it. it let me ask about, um, you, I think it was uh, you, Barbara, that brought up uh, differences. Clinicians have different views about experience versus patients. and. How do we do? Do we cross that chasm? Do we? How do we? Where do we go, in terms of, of bridging that gap? Well, I think we just have the have a conversation with everybody at the table and and, and finding out the differences. So, for example, um, based on our, our the survey that we did with the practices, they're doing really well in the patient experience, but they're you know doesn't correlate with practices that have more sort of supports in place for patient engagement. Like, what does that mean? What could that, you know, why could that be? Yeah. Um, I, I think that we have to understand, and I think we have to ask the practices, and the practices, like Lester Hartman's here, who's um, one of our, our, our star uh, pediatricians who in patient engagement, and he's done phenomenal things with self-management with his practice. And they have, I, I'm on his mailing list, and I get videos all the time about, 
your kids going off to college, how do you help them sort of manage uh, behavioral health and other kinds of issues and get their flu shots? And I, I'm just astounded with the amount of outpouring that Lester does um, in his practice in terms of empowering um, patients. And so I would say that there's a lot of correlation with what that practice has figured it out, like, the, you know, and presumably because they spend a lot of time with their patients and their fa the, um, and, and the parents. Um, I think that that's yeah. uh, understanding what your uh, your, you know, what, what your patients need and what they want is something that is, that's sort of the, um, the grail that we're, we're after and understanding it. Um, but it, there's so many people that are ready and willing, I mean, take this meeting to say, okay, yeah. here's what it is. I mean, this is the type of forum where we can say, okay, let's line these things up and say when we talk about engagement, um, you know, what's important. And I think that um, we have to talk about a regulatory environment because CMS has made some huge um, uh, strides in, in including patient engagement as part of the, the measurement, um, uh, the, you know, of the measures that are, are accountable. And so in this new macro legislation, there's, um, there's a number of measures around patient and family engagement. And we have to be really careful that they just don't become check the box yeah. things because they say, okay, you have a patient family council, well, check. And, you know, you have a care plan that the patients agree to. Well, how do you know the patient agreed to it? Did you say check here or? So, so there's, um, I think that um, while these measures are really good because they're starting to um, draw attention to the importance of this thing, there's still uh, an opportunity to miss the boat if we don't say, okay, what are they really trying to get at? Let me, let me ask another question. I want to shift and talk a little bit about the healthcare worker. In the business community, they say the customer is only as happy as your least happy employee. Mm -hmm. um, and you brought up, <clears throat> Pat, the, the, the experience about the lab. Yeah. A lot of the questions, the patient experience questions, go to the doctors and the nurses, but the experience is across the entire yeah. thing yeah. from the moment you try and get that phone call. Um, Talk about, or any, particularly you, Pat, talk about um, that healthcare yeah. worker yeah. Um, experience and skill yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. development. What's, what's interesting is that most of the situations, like the situation I've described, or I can tell other ones, it's not the person. So even, even that lab, you, you wonder what, what was going on there? What was, what was the environment like for those staff in the lab that they feel like they had to close the doors five minutes early? So if you truly are t thinking about these events like you would think about a safety event, you apply the same kind of understanding where you do a root cause analysis and you understand like what is fair and just about the situation that we put our employees in that they had to act that way. So the beautiful thing about this conversation about respect is that it's raising the conversation of respect among clinicians, among our staff, from patients and families towards our clinicians. So it's just changing the whole conversation and the dynamic of conversation in the hospital so that as we're moving forward thinking about how do we improve the patient experience, we're saying that really what we're trying to do is improve the Beth Israel Deaconess experience. That includes the experience for our providers, mm -hmm. the experience for our staff, the experience for our patients. because. They're all so interconnected that it's impossible to think about one without the other. Um, most of the really disrespectful organizational things that happen to our patients and families are a result of the systems that we've set up, where we, we've either incentivized production over um, patient-centeredness. Um, and so we're learning a lot about our systems and a lot about how um, our systems do not support the delivery of care. So I think it's all, there's, it's not, it, it can't be segregated because it just doesn't make any sense. And how, how are we going to drive those changes? How are we going to, how are we going to get? It's going to take a long time. I think that um, if you could start from scratch, you wouldn't set the hospital up the way it is or the clinics up the way they are now. But I think it's just going to be telling the terrible stories, motivating change. Um, like for physical harm, it was a block and tackle approach. And I think we have to do the same for patient experience, you know, pick out things and just um, resource supports to make it better for patients and families. Uh, because I think it's been neglected generally um, because of trying to serve other things around just let's try to get it right so people leave without being harmed physically. Now we have to think how do we have patients leave not being harmed physically but also emotionally whole. 
and how do we keep our staff emotionally whole so that they can be engaged at work in what is, I feel like, one of the most privileged positions to be in, taking care of patients. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a space of privilege, so. I want to make sure that we have a few minutes for folks. Why don't you start uh, going up to the mic? I want to do ask about having difficult conversations, particularly around cost, uh, uh, because you can have a great experience and then you find out how much you have to pay. So what, talk, maybe Grace, maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about the, the whole, where is the cost transparency uh, puzzle piece in, in this whole uh, area? Uh, something that I'm sure everyone can relate to is that as a patient, you can go in and doctors routinely prescribe treatment plans and it's as if we're operating in a vacuum and all of these options are available and then the patient comes home and finds out that this is going to be not covered, this is astronomical, how am I going to need a loan, I need to do something here, how can I, or forget it, I can't afford this. So now we have that, that difficult non-adherent patient. Uh, we do need to bring costs into discussions. We don't go into any business and talk in a vacuum without considerations for costs and what we're investing into. And when we're investing into our health care, uh, there has to be some ballpark, at least, discussions. We need to make that effort. I, I love the Open Notes initiative. I think that's going to bring more engagement. People are becoming more aware of costs, and I'm seeing, especially in the cancer arena that people are definitely being more considerate and, and realizing what this is going to look like. Do I want to take this treatment on for a year? What is this going to physically mean for myself, myself financially and for my family? Maybe cost stress needs to be part of your adverse events. Oh, yeah, it is. Is I mean, it? We, what, okay. Yeah. Well, let's take some questions. So Pat, I just want to commend your organization for bringing in the patients to um, the, the stories. I sit on the patient safety committee of um, a local hospital mm -hmm. hearing the stories at the board level and it is terrifying from a patient perspective and many times when they're looking at the statistics you a I'm able to ask the question well, well what did you tell the family yeah. and this is a oh my question for all three of you is what can we do here as an organization um, for SPM to help patients be prepared for what they hear when they sit on these advisory panels because we go in um, hopeful, but the system isn't necessarily ready for us to deal with the reality. And is there something we can do as an organization to prepare our members to be even better advocates to work with um, organizations? I think it's a great question, and um, MHQP's Consumer Council has actually been working um, to put together a en patient engagement handbook around engaging in different ways, and um, I think, as I said, there's a lot of overlap in these groups, so I think adding a section on how do you engage in an in a institutional advisory panel or, you know, a patient a PFACT or a patient advisory council would be a really useful chapter in that. Um, in, in those discussions because mm -hmm. I, I think it's a really valid question and um, I know that um, when it's, it's, such a, it's such a hard thing, um, it gets into a bigger picture of, of engaging patients and families in an organization over time and keeping them and, you know, their agenda versus the organization's agenda and then how do you, you know, how do you make sure that, it, that there's a good balance there. So I think that you raise just a huge issue that's, you know, that we're working really hard and we're in the early stages, but there's a lot there. And so I think um, having some people with this type of experience talking about what helped them and, you know, and, and what didn't or where they felt like I was totally unprepared because X, yeah. then it'll help us identify some of the challenges. We um, we had a can I answer? Okay, we had a um, a lot of conversation about getting patients and families on the our quality and safety board board, which hears all of the horrible things that happen to patients and families. And you know, it's a it's a the dynamics in the room are challenging because you have a lot of hospital leaders and members of the governance community in Boston and a lot of our chairmen who can be intimidating. There's so there's two patient family members on there and um, 
I love that they're there because I feel like they always ask the best question when we review what happens with the patient. And most often, so I'll, this would be my recommendation, the question to start with is exactly what you said. And it's a question that doesn't really challenge um, decision making around medical diagnosis or whatever, or <clears throat> technical skill in the operating room. But the question is, what does a pa patient and family understand about what happened? And so um, we, for years, we've been making sure that we ask that question about every event, because it's a journey, right? It's a journey of transparency. It's a journey of patient-centeredness. But sitting a patient or family in the room to say that question, oh, could, can you explain to me what does a patient and family understand about what happened, is the best question, because it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But it's how you transform the culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to add that just because someone is a patient, we have to remember not to assume that it's not synonymous with being weak or delicate. Some patients, and a lot of patients, are pretty incredible and can handle a lot and have handled a lot on their own. So they might have some incredible and powerful insight at these types of settings. So you might actually be learning more from them in crafting some of your initiatives. Uh, so don't be afraid to put it out there. But that being said, perhaps I would just suggest just a simple conversation because we're just people helping people and right. we do have emotions and responses and things that might be triggers or might be upsetting or that might be joyful. Follow up with a simple question. What really moved you or was something really upsetting as a regroup at the mm -hmm. end? Yeah. Thanks, Grace. Um, so I, I have a question for all of you, but uh, particularly for Pat. And Pat, I'm just so thrilled you can be here. Because what you're doing at Beth Israel is quite amazing, oh. <clears throat> where you're actually treating these uh, uh, events, of uh, problems with patient dignity, as if they were adverse events. And you're, you're, you're doing the investigation around them the yeah. same. So, so, so the question is a two-part question. Okay. So the first part is, you're publicizing this. You're actually exposing this to the world, right? You're oh, yeah. Letting, you're reporting this to everybody so everybody can see these things. And so my first part of the question is, how did you ever make that happen? And, you know, <laughs> oh, okay. what were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? So I'll let you answer that, and then I'll get to the second part of the question. So we, it, it started by just opening, maybe 10 years ago, opening, a, we, had, we, we were segregating the patient experience work from the patient safety work, the quality work. And then we started opening the patient safety, the patient quality work with a terrible story, just to start a conversation in the room. So it started that way. And then it evolved where we recognized false distinction. This, mm -hmm. These groups cannot be separate. This needs to be one quality safety patient experience group. Mm -hmm. And so we just transitioned to that. It was, it was wicked. And I picked the worst. I, I pick, I mostly I have a lot of credibility. I've been there for 30 years. So people, they're not going to kick me out. <laughs> Maybe they will. But, but um, there's nothing like a story. Yeah. So um, I think just do it. It's just, just do it. So, so to, to pick up on that, the second part of my question, this involves all of you, is that, you know, in the early days of uh, the patient safety movement, we were reporting on the most egregious things. You know, we would, we would report right. those kind of things. And we sort of, we realized over time that, the, well, there are things that are not so egregious that probably are important too, and there are near misses and things that we should be looking into as well. So you mentioned Model T stage. Tom mentioned Model T stage. We're in early stages in terms of this patient centered things, these, these patient dignity mm -hmm. issues. Um, when will we get to the point where we're not only reporting these horrific things that make your toes curl, but that we're actually creating a system so that it really is, you know, it, it, it's easy for our patients. Our patients can actually move through the system and, uh, and comfortable or arranging appointments so that they're seeing all their specialists on the same day. When, how, how do we get to that point and, and how do we report and advertise those kind of things? Mm -hmm. How long is that going to take? Uh, oh, I think it's going to take at least another 10 years. It's going to take a while. I feel like we have to, I, I think you use, the, you use the most severe stories, but then underneath each of those stories are a hundred more stories that are like that, but didn't re yes. re result in that. And then you think about, you know, so for the lab, for example, with this person, like, why can't, why, why does the lab have to be set up that way? Like, why can't you have an app like Uber, where the phlebotomists are floating around the building, in the medical building? And and you, you, you are a physician and you know this person needs a phlebotom to be phlebotomized. And you just look at an Uber app and you know that in five minutes a phlebotomist is going to be. Like there's so, we, we're stuck. Like I can't think of it. It makes my head explode because I've like been in that same culture for 40 years. There's, there's a new way to think about how we restructure. And I feel, so I feel like we'll get there eventually. But it's going to take a while. 
I just want to say, I wish there there's so many things that are bad and wrong and need to be fixed. I wish there was a central repository of positives that we could all turn to and say, oh, this worked. Because everyone talks, yes, it's, it's uh, very imperfect, I'll say, healthcare, right? But there's a lot of great things. There's a lot of incredible people. There's a lot of initiatives. There's a lot of positive changes happening. I wish there was a, a, a book, a, a website that you could just turn to and say, hey, you know what? Can we create something like that? Is there something like that? Yeah. I just, I, I helped uh, um, get tra a secure email across the VA nationally. And when we first started, there were, there were five to ten percent of emails had really positive comments. You know, this, this is great and thank you for this. And the frontline staff who were opening those emails were, were not sending them on to the rest of the team. They were just not deleting them, but just archiving them. And I, I was just like, don't do that. It's so rare that we, you know, we always get sort of slapped on the wrist and, 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 and the healthcare staff yeah. need that positive feedback. Let's, so we, can I just answer that? Because it's something that we've thought a lot about. And, and I, unfortunately, I think the payment system has to be thrown out before this gets fixed. Yeah, because I mean the incentives are, are skewed. I mean, in some cases they're skewed to give you inappropriate treatment. In the cases of pain and, and pain assessment and, and, and treating um, people, there's there's also what it takes is um, all this stuff. Dignity takes people treating other people like people, and that takes time. And our system has just gotten so rushed that there's no time. And you know, if you can't develop trust, you know, the, the, it's not going to be there. You're not going to treat people as you want to be treated. And but the bonus is, if you fix this, you'll fix clinician burnout too. I think. Yeah. So. Thank you. Okay, two more two more questions, then we need to wrap up. Go ahead, Tom. As an old man, I want to give a historical perspective a little bit about mm -hmm. patients, and also going beyond Boston. I, I grew up in England with the aphorism: "Patience is a virtue." Virtue is a grace, and Grace was a naughty girl who never washed her face. <laughs> so in, in um, the late 1980s, we started at the Beth Israel, something called the Picker Institute, in which we began to collect the early first patient reports about experiences, and we worked with a very young woman named Barbara Rapson and other people like that <laughs> on, do, on doing that. And we began shrieking then, Pat, about how patients should be involved in all the work plans and all the groups. And it's taken, what, 27 years. But you can also go way beyond Boston. If you go to Utah, and the University of Utah, um, they there post reports publicly and openly about patient feedback on the individual clinician's experience. Um, I've always wanted that. I would like to know what my patients feel about me. If, if my boss is mad at me, my mother's mad at me, my patient's mad at me, or my colleague's mad at me, the one I care about the most is the patient. And that's just the way clinicians are socialized. Yeah. And um, we should be feeding back individual reports to individual clinicians in a systematic way, and the Beth Israel should stop talking about it and should begin do doing it. it now that you're the Vice President for yeah. Quality. Get Thank with you. it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Okay, Peter, last question. So, <clears throat> my comment um, or challenge is kind of from the perspective of somebody doing 40 years of primary care, a fair distance away from academia, um, who will never recover from the drive into Boston this morning. Yeah. Um, I think we've hinted at, but only hinted at the elephant in the room in our discussion about the difference between metrics and stories and the payment system as ways, as you said, Sue, how do we move the needle forward? How do we actually get change started? Uh, and the metaphor or analogy I would use is the way I picked my favorite physical therapy resource in the community where I practiced. We had four or five very good well-trained collections of physical therapists. And so if I had a patient with shoulder pain, from most of those physical therapy resources, I would get a very nice report saying that the range of motion had increased from this number of degrees to that, and their pain scale had decreased from this to that. But there was one that I used as my primary referral source. And that one always started the, answer, the um, report to me. 
Uh, the patient identified her primary goal as putting the kayak on the car without her husband's help so she could go <laughs> kayaking when he was away on a business trip, and she is now able to do it. And until we change the frame mm -hmm. so that the patient, is, and it's not a question of the patient setting the goals, because that still assumes that I as a clinician or our system has defined health. And so we start with the patient as a whole. If I define health and then the patient sets the goals to meet my definition of health, got to go back one step. The patient has to define what health is and what the goals are to do that. Uh, we kind of no, slid away into right. tactics yeah, and away from I that core right. point. So that was my, my challenge. That, that's a great way to end. Yeah. In fact, I have a, um, a colleague in Minnesota, and she had needed hip replacement surgery. And she's a clinician. And so she went into this, and she said, I want to be able to walk up the stairs without pain, and I want to be able to garden. And so in Minnesota, they collect patient-reported outcomes on hip and knees. So, so fine. So that was one of the questions, and she answered. Had the surgery. It went well. Had physical therapy. went well. And they said, well, we're discharging you. And she said, what are you talking about? I still can't walk up the stairs without pain, and I can't do the gardening. But they were like, but you're better. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Grace, oh, Pat, welcome. Barbara. And um, as they exit, they, we got people in the back. If you're sitting next to an empty chair, make sure it's empty. <laughs> Get your stuff on it because we have people in the back uh, of the room who can who can sit down for the rest of the morning before our break. Thank you.